I did something a couple of weeks ago that I have never done. I took the time during the NFL draft to watch the entire first round. I think it started on a Thursday night, um, around 7 o'clock or so, something like that, and took about three hours or so, if I recall correctly. And uh, I watched the entire first round of the NFL draft. Never done it before. I must admit to you, after that Thursday night, I didn't keep up with much of what was going on in the NFL draft, except that I was kind of paying attention for uh, a few players being drafted that I recognized, that I knew from, from my favorite team. So when it got down to the last day and the seventh round of the draft, I wasn't paying much attention. You probably weren't paying much attention. Uh, Hardly anybody probably was paying a whole lot of attention. And, and, And so when you come to the seventh round, the 249th overall player selected, nobody usually ever really cares. Unless that person had recently announced that they were gay. And all of a sudden, everybody cared. Or so it seems. That's exactly what happened when the St. Louis Rams drafted the 2013 SEC Defensive Player of the Year, the seventh round, 249th overall player drafted. The media coverage went nuts with this, as you already know, and uh, it's about all that you heard about for the next several days, and you continue to hear about it. And uh, it's also been reported in recent days that, I'll just refer to it as the kiss, it was staged, they planned that, Uh, they wanted it to be a, a media stunt, circus, whatever you want to call it, I understand Uh, that there was additional video of these two individuals uh, eating cake together, and I won't even go into that. I haven't seen it, but I understand it was quite disturbing. Nobody would have been paying attention at all if just a football player got drafted in the seventh round, the 249th overall pick. But because this this young man had recently announced that he was gay. It was all in the news. Everybody paid attention. I suggest to you that there really is a pro-homosexual agenda in this country. I guess we're several years behind in finally admitting that. But it's been happening, and if you can't see it, you're blind. I looked out a moment ago out to, the, out to the west and maybe to the north a little bit, and I saw some dark clouds. Okay, everybody's go ahead and look right now. <laughs> I, I know you're going to. You know what that indicates to me? It indicates to me uh, that there's a storm coming. There's some rain probably coming. You can see it happening. You can see it coming. I suggest to you there's a storm coming. We're going to deal with this. It's not that we choose to deal with this. We're going to deal with this. And I'm not so naive to think that it's going to be an easy thing. I'm not so naive to think that everything that we will say from this pulpit, perhaps from our Bible school classes, from our youth classes, will fall on agreeing ears. Because one thing I know for sure, no matter what the topic is, when you take this book and you preach it, there will be a plenty of people to disagree with you. So we accept that. We understand that. But in a lot of ways, this seems a little different. Because it seems like there is such a, a, an agenda to normalize and, yes, even legalize the homosexual lifestyle in the United States of America. Now, you heard about Michael Sam getting drafted, but I submit to you something else happened that you might not have even heard about. Matter of fact, I've just seen it mentioned a couple of times. It might have had a 30-second coverage on ESPN at some point or another, but I was looking at my Twitter feed, and I couldn't help but notice a a day or two after the draft, this particular tweet. 
And it tells us that there was a, a young, brave man who didn't get any media coverage. What this is referring to is a, a, a pick from the Eagles. It was actually a free agent contract from the Philadelphia Eagles. A young man who served our country. And I have the AP article in my hand. I didn't want to put it on the screen. I knew you couldn't read it, but I've got a copy of the Associated Press article right here telling us about this young man. His name is, and I'll probably butcher it, Alejandro Villanueva. 6'9", 277, he played college football for Army. And about the last five years, you know what he's been doing? He's been on three tours in Afghanistan. He was awarded the bronze medal for valor. You see what we're doing? We're redefining what a hero really is. Because if you've been listening, the media has been telling you that Michael Sam's, Sam is a hero. That he's brave. But what have you heard about this, um, this young man that played football at Army and then served in the United States Army and really became a servant, put his life on the line, put himself into situations where he could have lost his life for defending the freedoms of this great country, defending the freedom that this other fellow seems to be trying to employ right now. And yet one is seen as a hero, and one can't even hardly make the news. You see what, how we have redefined what it means to be brave, and what it means to be a hero? You know, last time I checked, is it really, are you really being brave to um, call a news conference and tell everybody that you like boys instead of girls? Is, is it really, do you really have to be brave to do that anymore? Because you know what's going to happen? You're not going to get persecuted. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get praise. And, and if you want to meet the President of the United States, call a news conference and announce you're gay. You'll probably get an invitation to the White House because you're his friend and he's going to praise you. He's going to tweet about you. He's going to say you're a hero. You're, he's going to say you're a patriot. That's where we're at. That's that storm that's on the horizon. I don't know which bothers you the most. For, for someone to say, you Bible thumpers are crazy. You need to get with the 21st century. Why do you care what two men or two women do in the privacy of their own bedroom? See, that's one part of the pro-homosexual agenda that just says to, to us that believe the Bible, that believe that the Bible actually teaches that the homosexual lifestyle is wrong. They just say, you're nuts. You know, and in some ways I've got to admit, it's easier for me to deal with that than it is for me to deal with another aspect of this. And that's what I want to deal with today. Another aspect of the pro-homosexual agenda, there are people that actually say, you can take the Bible and shoot holes through what we say. There are people who say, you can legitimize, you can scripturalize homosexual activity by using the Bible. I think that's the darker cloud that's on the horizon. And the reason it's darker is because I'm concerned that there are people who have called themselves Christians. There are churches who have aligned themselves with Christ that are all of a sudden saying, you know, I think, I think they're right. I'm not talking about this congregation, but I'm talking about Christianity at large, even in our country. And there are many so-called Christian leaders who are saying, you know, we need to rethink this homosexual thing. And maybe we've been wrong all along. I, I was made aware of this uh, when I was taking graduate classes at Fried Hardeman University. I'd never heard this. I was so naive of course, it was a different time back in those days, too. But I would have never thought that someone would have taken 
or tried to have taken the Bible and say, it's okay for you to do certain sinful things because the Bible, we've misunderstood the Bible and it actually um, makes what we've said was sin all along okay because we need to rethink about the way we look at these things. And I, that's the first time I'd ever heard anything like that. It just amazed me that there were actual supposedly Bible-believing people that said you could take the Bible and you could prove that certain sinful things are okay. But that's where we're at. That's part of that dark cloud. And that's what I want us to deal with today. There will always be people who say, you religious folks are just nuts. You Bible believers are too simple thinking. You're too naive. You are... You're really ignorant of the way the real world is. That's always going to happen. You're always going to be in the minority to people like that. But we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to answer the pro-homosexual agenda, particularly those who are trying to say the Bible supports this. And that's what I want us to do this morning for the next few minutes. I want us to deal with what you might call some of the uh, allegations that have been raised, some of the arguments that have been made that suggest that you can take the Bible and show that homosexual behavior is legitimate, even okay in God's eyes. So let's, let's talk about those things for just a few moments. First thing I want us to talk about. It has been alleged that the Bible really doesn't help us define marriage. Now we're going to talk about this kind of in general and then more specifically here in just a moment. But, but this is what the allegation is. This is the allegation. They say no sensible person can read the Bible and understand what, what God wants marriage to look like. Because what they say is, are you telling me that Abraham is an example of... Um, what God really wants marriage to look like. What, what they would say is that, you know, Abraham had his wife Sarah, but he went in and slept with her handmaid. Is that really what you think godly marriage should be all about? Then they might bring up the example of Jacob, how he fathered children with multiple women. Is that really, and he had wives, had two wives. Is that really what your Christian marriage really is all about? Is what they would say. They would say, well, what about David? He killed another man so he could have his wife sleep with her. He kept her. Is that your example of marriage between a husband and a wife? Oh, what about your great wise man of the Bible, Solomon, who had all those thousands of wives and concubines? So that's marriage. You see what they're doing? Here's the problem with all of these opponents of traditional marriage. Here's, here's what they don't understand. The mistakes and the sins of Bible characters, even its heroes, are never covered up in any kind of way. As a matter of fact, to cite the sins of men like Abraham and Jacob and David and Solomon, and say that in some way or another, this somehow proves that a marriage between a husband and a wife is really not God's definition of marriage, is a gross misunderstanding of the Word of God. Someone says, well, well, why does the Bible contain these stories of men who sinned? Well, I think it's fairly simple. Number one, the Bible tells us the facts about these people. It allows us to see what a mess they made of their lives when they took matters into their own hands. It's another topic for another time. But I am telling you that what Abraham did with Hagar and what resulted his son Ishmael, this world is still paying the price for that right now. The Middle East turmoil that has existed, exists, and will always exist is fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I don't hear any politicians ever talking about that. But that's what the Bible says about it. And it's because a man didn't respect God's plan for him. God all along wanted him to wait till Isaac was born, but he took matters into his own hands. 
You know, God at times allowed men to do things. The Bible describes it out of the, out of the hardness of their own hearts. So he could later show how foolish that was. That term, incidentally, that you read about in Matthew 19 and verse 8, the hardness of men's hearts. One um, Greek lexicon says that means destitute of spiritual perception. See, anytime we do things that vary from God's will for our life, we are showing the destitute of spiritual perception. See, Romans 15, 4 says all of these stories were written for our learning. They were written to show us what, what, what you, kind of trouble you can really get yourself into when marriage between a man and a woman isn't respected. All these men sinned and did things. They, uh, they, they took matters into their own hands. They went beyond what God's original plan really was for them from the very beginning. It's also alleged, secondly, that Jesus or the Bible never explicitly, it's a key word here, explicitly defined marriage as being between one man and one woman, if you want to add that to the point. Never explicitly defined marriage as being between one man and one woman. Now I've got to tell you just right up front that this claim is based on complete ignorance. You know, sometimes people say things that are just so obvious, but if you don't know the Bible, you might accept their lie. This is a lie. Because the Bible does explicitly define marriage between a man and a woman. From the very beginning, Moses recorded this in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. A man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave or be united to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. A man and a woman. That's the first definition of marriage that you read about in the Bible. And Jesus believed that was true because in Matthew chapter 19 and um, verses six, 4 through 6, he actually quoted what Moses said originally from Genesis, and he added a little bit to it when he said, Have you not read that he, God, who created them, created them male and female? And then he quotes this passage in Genesis 2 and verse 24. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And he went on to say, So no longer are there two but one. Therefore what God hath joined together, let no man separate. From the very beginning, and even when Jesus was teaching about principles that would later be associated with Christianity, the Bible and Jesus specifically define marriage as between a man and a woman. I'll throw an extra passage in here for you. I don't have it on the screen. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Go read about how it is specifically mentioned about a male and a female in that passage. In the marriage setting. See, the truth of the matter is, God always intended for marriage to be like He wanted it to be from the very beginning. Mankind is the one that altered it. Mankind took upon himself multiple wives. And even in the Old Testament, in both the Old Testament days and the New Testament days, there was the deviation from the one man, one woman, to one man, multiple women, to even men with men and women with women. It was always a deviation from God's original plan. And yes, if anybody alleges that the Bible never explicitly defines marriage between... Uh, a male and a female, you can tell them they're wrong. And you can show them these verses. Next thought. It's alleged that Jesus or the Apostle Paul had a, what would be called a low view of marriage. Let me put this in its context. First of all, it's claimed that Jesus had a lacking interest in the institution of marriage. And here are some of the reasons that are given. Number one, they say, well, he wasn't married. Number two, they say, he taught people that they might ought to leave that relationship and follow him. Or number three, they might say, he even said that in heaven, we're not going to be married. We're going to be like the angels. So let's deal with that. First of all, it's true. Jesus wasn't married. 
That is a fact. But that doesn't mean he had a low view of marriage. As a matter of fact, I can think of a number of, of common sense reasons why Jesus wouldn't have gotten married. And the fact that, well, I won't even go there. I'll just tell you that what makes the most sense to me is he knew he was here for a limited time and he knew he was going to die a horrible death. And in my mind, that makes sense that he wouldn't want to leave a widow behind having seen him go through that. But just because he wasn't married doesn't mean that he had a low view of marriage. Secondly, the fact that Jesus taught people that our relationship with God is more important than our relationship with our spouse. And if you really look at the passage in, in play here, Matthew 10, 36 through 39, even a relationship with our children, that is true. He, he did teach that it's more important to have a relationship with God. And he did teach us that some of the greatest turmoil a Christian might ever have is with their own family. That doesn't mean that he didn't appreciate marriage and support marriage and believe in marriage. Ideally, a person could be married and still be faithful. But what Jesus is teaching is that if a spouse kept you from being faithful, you still need to follow Jesus. And what is conveniently forgotten here is that specifically the relationship between a parents and children are mentioned. And I find it very interesting that the pro-homosexual agenda, one of the things that they want in these unions is to have the legal right to adopt children. They want a family. But they conveniently overlook that part of this story here in Matthew chapter 10. It was Jesus who defended marriage. He believed in marriage. He defended marriage. He, he saw what was happening he saw that people were discarding marriage, easy divorce and remarriage. He saw it happening under the law. And what he did in Matthew chapter 19, incidentally, is he said, we're going to take things back to the way they should, be, should have been all alone. His law for divorce and remarriage in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9 is exactly what God intended all alone. It was Jesus who confronted the Samaritan woman who was abusing marriage, who was actually living with a man that she called her husband who really wasn't her husband. And what about that Matthew chapter 22 argument? That point in Matthew chapter 22 was not to teach about marriage. It was to teach about the resurrection. And, it, and it's just taking it totally out of context to suggest that Jesus, by saying that when we're in heaven, we'll be like the angels, neither married nor given in marriage. All he was doing, he was answering a, an allegation that the Sadducees brought before him, who didn't believe in the resurrection, incidentally, about a woman who had been married who had seven husbands. And according to Jewish law, if one of them died, another one of the brothers should have married her. And they said, what if all of these die? Like the law says, the brothers should do. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? They were trying to trick Jesus. It had nothing to do about if Jesus believed in marriage or not. And Jesus said, well, you know, what you don't get is, Sadducees, the resurrection is true, and in the resurrection we'll be like the angels, neither given in marriage or married. What about Paul's view of marriage? It's, it's alleged that Paul had a low view of marriage as well. Uh, let's briefly deal with that. Critics cite Paul's single life and his famous statement about how he believed it was better to be single as a reason that he did not appreciate marriage and had a low view of it. In 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 26, Paul did say, uh, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. In other words, if you're single, stay single. And that's what some people say as Paul is saying, see, he didn't really believe marriage was a good thing. They also cite what they call Paul's view that marriage is only the second best alternative. That part of the passage where he says, if you can't exercise self-control, 1 Corinthians 7, about verses 8 and 9, if you can't exercise self-control, it's better to marry than burn. People say, see, he didn't really think marriage was a, a high calling. It was a great relationship. He saw it as a second best type thing. 
But once again, the critics who allege that Paul didn't have a high view of marriage, they're taking these verses totally out of context. Just because Paul didn't get married is not proof that he didn't approve of marriage. And the context, uh, in the context of that statement in 1 Corinthians 7, 26 about the present distress, almost all scholars agree that Paul is talking about the pending um, persecution that's coming under Nero. And, and he, what he was saying contextually is, if you're single, it's better to stay single right now as a Christian than to get married and have to go through this together, have to go through the persecution together. And that's why that statement about it's better to marry than to burn. Paul must have personally felt that he could be most useful to God while being single. That's all he was saying. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 3, he tells people who are married exactly how they are to behave. He tells them that they are to render their conjugal rights to one another. He gives the, the rules for that about periods of separation and such like. Getting kind of to the heart of the matter, though, this is one that is probably most often cited. It's alleged, it is alleged that Paul never spoke a word against homosexuality. Now, if you can't remember anything else that we discussed this morning, I want you to really pay attention and listen to what I'm about to say. The claim that is made that Paul never spoke a word against homosexuality is believed to mean that Paul, in saying something about homosexuality in a few verses that we're about to see, wasn't talking about the kind of homosexuality that two men or two women might have in a monogamous homosexual relationship. In other words, what these people are saying is that anytime Paul mentions something about homosexuality, he's talking about promiscuous homosexuality. He might be talking about, they would say, a homosexual rape. Or he might even be talking about how in the first century, if you lived in several of the big cities, you could go to one of the pagan temples and you could find you a homosexual prostitute. And you could actually worship your pagan deity by committing a sex act. And those that allege that Paul never specifically condemned homosexuality, they're saying every time you read about Paul saying something about homosexuality, it just means you know, these certain kinds of acts. You know, rape or promiscuous activity or temple worship. It's not talking about if two men are committed to one another and they're faithful to one another and they want to live in a house down the street just like you live in your subdivision and, send, and adopt and send their kids to your same school and get the same tax benefits that you get as a married couple. What they're saying is Paul doesn't condemn that. He just condemns these other things. Well, let's just let's think about that for a moment. What does Paul say? Well, in, first of all, in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, 27, he says, he's talking about the sins of the Gentiles here. Romans 1, verse 27. He says, and listen to how he describes this. Men who likewise gave up the natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Listen to how this is rendered in the ESV. Men committing shameless acts. Do you see any kind of differentiation between any kind of homosexual relationship in, in this particular statement? Instead, I would submit to you what you see is a condemnation of the act itself. Furthermore, Romans, or rather 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. In verse 9 in particular, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor uh, adulterers. The King James here in this particular passage it, uh, is more specific. 
The ESV says those who practice homosexuality, but the New King James says nor homosexuals or sodomites. And the, the, this is a very specific statement that is rendered in the New King James. Because the first part of that, nor homosexuals, would refer to would refer to the passive individual in that relationship, nor sodomites would refer to the aggressor or the active one in that relationship. And once again, there is no difference made in the act itself whether it would be in a monogamous relationship, a loving relationship, or a promiscuous one. And then over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient. For the ungodly and sinners, listen to these words, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, listen to all of these profane, sinful, ungodly activities. Verse 10 says, for the sexually immoral, for the sodomites. Or once again, the ESV says, those who practice homosexuality. Again, the emphasis is put upon the act itself. Now, listen to me very carefully. I want you to follow what I'm saying here. Heterosexual sexual relations. Heterosexual sexual relations in the proper place in a scriptural marriage is a good thing. Sex between two people who are scripturally married is never wrong. Sometimes, sex between a man and a woman is wrong if it's outside of a scriptural marriage. So you see the difference. Sometimes, heterosexual activity, sexual activity, is wrong. But if it's in the right relationship, the God-prescribed relationship, in a scriptural marriage, God praises it. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14, uh, 4, the marriage bed is undefiled. It's on, marriage is honorable among all. The bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So see, there's a difference. Sometimes it's good, and it's right, and it's appropriate. Sometimes it's not. Now hear me real clear. Never, not one time, anywhere in the Bible, is there any kind of difference made in a homosexual sexual act. It's always wrong. Don't matter why you do it. Don't matter how much you love somebody. How long you've lived with them. It don't matter if it's promiscuous. If it's the temple deities. If it's because you've been with somebody for 10 or 15 or 20 years. It's always wrong. It's the act itself. It's the act itself that is wrong. And that is why Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22 says... God sees it as an abomination. It's the act itself. Leviticus 18 and verse 22 describes the act. When a man lies with another man like he lies with a woman. When a man has a sexual relationship with another man in the place of having a sexual relationship with a, another woman, he says that's an abomination. That's the word in the Bible that means it makes God sick. It makes God sick. One final thing. It's alleged. It's alleged that Jesus reached out to everybody. Now, what the homosexual pro-agenda is saying is it's acceptable to practice homosexuality because Jesus accepted people who were on the margins of society. They say if Jesus was here today, he'd be reaching out to the homosexual community. For once, I agree with what they're saying. 
They're right. He would be. But here's what you've got to remember. Reaching out doesn't equate acceptance. It is true that Jesus reached out to people who are on the margins of society. For instance, he was criticized for doing this when he reached out to tax collectors, the most hated people in the first century. When he reached out to tax collectors, when he reached out to sinners as they were called. But you know what he said about it? He said in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. What he's saying is, these are the people I came to reach out to. And I want to remind you that when Jesus reached out to sinners, he always had something to say like this. Go and sin no more. He would have reached out to them, sure. He would reach out to homosexuals today. He'd say, I love you. I came to die for you. But you've got to repent. You've got to stop this sinful behavior. That's what he told other sinners. That's what he told the Samaritan woman. Essentially, you're living with someone that's not your husband. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says that we should be prepared to make a defense or we should be ready to give an answer. Anyone who asks us of the hope that is in us. That's what we've tried to do today. We've, we've tried to give a defense of what the Bible says about this matter. We, we know that some people want to know. We, we, we know that the world doesn't always agree with what we preach. And our one hope today is that even if someone disagrees, they won't take what we've said out of context and try to show that we're doing something or saying something that we really aren't saying. See, what we're saying is that, if, that Jesus really loves everybody. What we're saying is that Jesus came to save everybody. What we're saying is that Jesus has a plan for everybody. But what we're also saying is there are prerequisites for receiving his forgiveness for everybody that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals or sodomites nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God people that commit these sins and do not change cannot go to heaven. But listen to this. Paul says to this church at Corinth, but such were some of you. The church at Corinth had somebody that was like this in it. He says, but such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us always to preach your word. Help us always to be faithful in defense of what is right. Heavenly Father, we pray that the things we've said today have been appropriate, that they've been faithful, that they've been scriptural. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we will defend ourselves, we will arm ourselves to defend what you want for us in our lives. We pray that marriage as it's defined by the Bible will be strong. It'll be strong in our own homes, in our own churches, and in this country. And Father, to those who disagree with us, we pray that even though they may disagree, they won't twist our words and make the church out to say something that we're not saying. Help them know that we still care. Help us to separate sin from the sinner. Help us to hate the sin. Help us to love the sinner. And most importantly, Father, help us, no matter what our struggle is, no matter what our sin is, to realize that we can be washed, that we can be sanctified, and that we can be justified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to be washed, if you need to be sanctified, if you need to be justified, the imitation of Jesus is for you. If you need to respond, please come right now as we stand and as we sing.